Professor Jean-Pierre Lasota Hirschowicz. He's a professor of astrophysics at Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center of the Polish Academy of Sciences. His area of research includes relativistic astrophysics and also non-relativistic astrophysics, in particular compact binary systems, black holes, accretion disks, relativistic jets. And uh, let me also add that he's also an author and co-author of several popular science books, one of which is entitled The Trouble with Eureka, What Do Physicists Argue About? So later on, we will have the opportunity to listen what do physicists argue about. Uh, first, I would like to thank Bernard to, uh, for his talk, which is an uh, excellent introduction uh, to the concept of anthropic principle. I also want to thank you for mentioning that the first paper you read was my paper, which I, I thought it was one of the first papers, but now so I, I really am so proud that I, uh, be, be even, even being invited to, to give a talk in some prestigious Congress is nothing compared to that. Uh, so I, my title is A View from Outside, the outside is, uh, it's not that I'm in another universe, but uh, I never really, I never wrote a paper about uh, the uh, anthropic principle, I, but I have a view that uh, comes from sitting for almost 15 years, very often in Brandos Carter office because we were together in Meudon in the Department of Relativistic Astrophysics and Cosmology. And I was discussing with him uh, the anthropic principle, or to be more precise, he was talking about the anthropic principles. And when Brandor starts talking, it is very difficult to put a word. But uh, he had, of course, much more to say about the anthropic principle. So I could see and follow the evolution of his view. So I am very familiar with the anthropic principle. I, uh, I don't think it is very useful, as a, so that you will see this a, a critical view, but as I realized listening to, uh, to Bernard, we, in fact, we, are, we do not differ very much. As, as you will see, and some, some of my transparencies are very similar to, to or, or the same as Bernard's. Uh, just before I start listening, to Bernard and seeing uh, Bob Dickey's uh, weak anthropic principle, I thought I can use it to myself. I'm 80. Why well, am 80? If I was two, I wouldn't be speaking here. Of course, I wouldn't be invited. If I was 200, I would be dead for a long time. For a long time. So, what is the value of such weak anthropic principle? I mean, what have I learned? That I, am, I learned that I'm alive, but I knew it anyway. Okay, so I will start with other dangers of the anthropic principle. It is, it was implicitly in Bernard's talk, but if you compare the strong anthropic principle by Brother Carter with Pongloss from uh, Walter's Candide, and uh, Pongloss said it is demonstrable that things cannot be otherwise they are for all these things have been created for some end. They must necessarily be created for the best end. And then the famous observe, for instance, the, the nose is formed for spectacles. Therefore, we wear spectacles. So the question is, is the nose finally tuned for spectacles? Or to use Brandon's words, or must the nose be such as to admit spectacles? And of course, this is a interesting anthropological question that has been addressed. And you can say, uh, this is sort of a semi-joke. I'm not going to say on that, but you can see they are, there is the, the in evolution, cause, correlation, effect are not always identical. So as I will point it several times, one should be very careful by using anthropic anthropic principle or anthropic reasoning, trying to explain uh, uh, various phenomena or various coincidences or things like that. 
So, since it is uh, the Copernicus Congress, I would like to mention, I'm not the first to do that, of course, that the first anthropic question followed from Copernicus moving the Earth on an orbit. And the question, the anthropic question is, why on this orbit? There could be a, an answer that it was God who put it in, in this orbit. I use a, now Jean Eiffel probably is forgotten, but it was very popular in 50 years ago or more. His cartoons about God, angels, were very popular. So it, was, it is there because God put it, it's moving the Earth to an orbit, doesn't remove the possibility that it was... A, it was created by God. But another uh, explanation is that if the Earth were in a different orbit, life wouldn't be impossible. We know that they are the habitable zones. And what is important in this reasoning is that, it, in a sense, it is a multiverse reasoning. If there was only sun and one planet, Earth, the question why it is on this orbit would make much sense. It, uh, but since we know there are other planets and other pl planetary systems with planets on various orbits, so we have this multiverse of planets and planetary systems, and this, this question makes sense. The, this is, I'm, I'm using here the, uh, a, a quotation from, from Steve Weinberg, who, who uh, treated as a sort of anthropic explanation is just common sense. But to ask this question and have a sensible answer, we need a multiverse of planets in this thing. And there's also a fact that is often forgotten in, or never mentioned in uh, uh, anthropic discussion is the moon itself is anthropic. Because it, it appears that without the moon, the uh, uh, variation of the Earth's obliquity would be such that the climate would be totally unstable, like it's on Mars, for example. And life on Mars, oh, sorry, <laughs> life on Mars, I would, I would say, would be impossible. Mars on Earth would be impossible. So, since the formation of moon is a result from an accidental collision, so there is something very special, not only about the Earth's orbit, but the fact that it captures the moon. Uh, so you could say, but what would explain that catching the moon was anthropic? Why the moon is on this orbit? Because, because life otherwise would be impossible. This is not an explanation. And I think it's, it's not used as an explanation. So I'm showing it that one should be very careful not overuse anthropic explanation, because here, okay, I, we stop. I mean, it's, it's very useful, of course, because I, I don't have to make models of capture of, of uh, yeah, we still not know how, how Moon uh, joined the Earth. But if I say it's, it is because we are here, so forget about it. I mean, do something else. Uh, so these are these multiverses, but these multiverses are not planets, etc., they are not the same as uh, I will see in a moment of the, of the modern physics because we can observe them. We can observe and compare with, with our universe. And this makes a lot of difference. And uh, I would like to propose or to say, I'm not the first time, but the first to do it is that the anthropic principle requires multiverse. And I would like to to uh, quote here Tom Nagel, uh, an eminent uh, American philosopher, who said that without the hypothesis of multiple universes, the observation that if life hadn't come into existence, we wouldn't be here, had no significance. What well, doesn't show that something doesn't require explanation by pointing out that if it is the condition for one's existence, and then I like very much this example, if I ask for an explanation of the fact that the air pressure in the transcontinental jet is close to, the, to that at the sea level, it is not an answer to point out it where I would be dead. So 
we need to make sense of anthropic principle multiverses, and I think this was Bernard suggested, and uh, that the difference between cosmological multiverses and planetary multiverses is that they, they are not observed, and in principle they cannot be observed. So, uh, just a historical uh, remark that when Brandon Carter introduced the strong anthropic principle, he used the word as the as a last resort. We can we, we have to propose multiverses, but I think he he evolved afterwards. But when he realized that the anthropic principle would make sense only when multiverses are, exist or are supposed to exist, then he clearly didn't like it. This is the last resort, and because. I think he was aware that, uh, this is here I quote George Ellis, that the multiverse theory cannot make any testable prediction because it can explain everything, as I shown in the example with the moon. We ask a question, he said, it is there, and we are there, so this is the explanation. So in this sense, uh, the anthropic principle is demotivating, I would say. I would say that the, the modern situation is that the anthropic principle results from our ignorance. We don't know why the calories constants have the values they have. I, I expected that Bernard would talk about the calories uh, constants, but he didn't. He talked about other constants. This when his famous article with Martin Rees, they introduced the four fundamental constants that has to be explained is the mass of the electron, the two masses of the, of the up and down quark and the uh, 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 strong force um, uh, uh, constant. We don't know, so we are, instead of some people, instead of trying to calculate it from fundamental theory, they say it is the anthropic principle, they can be different, and they are different in, 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 in other multiverses. And when we are asking if the, or we are claiming that the universe is fine-tuned to life, we don't know the origin of life, and I, I will talk more about it. But if we could derive the values of all constants of physics from theory alone, there would be no reason for anthropic arguments. Bernard mentioned that in, in one of his last slides. Now the question is, that I would ask, is it possible? Since it is a session of philosophical question, I would like to, to uh, uh, quote uh, uh, Spinoza because I, I don't, uh, using the mechanistic point of view, as Bernard says, it's maybe not, not, not exact. Uh, so Spinoza was against multiverses, he even found it absurd. For Spinoza, the word that exists is the only one possible. If it were different, there would be two natures, and for him it was, it was against the principle. Of, of course, he, he talks about God. It is debatable, it's still debatable, what Spinoza thought God is. He, he writes clearly that God or nature, and it seems that in, in, in many contexts, God meant nature. So, uh, clearly, uh, there's a... According to Spinozan views, there is one possible word, and considering even other words, it's simply absurd. It's not based on, on, on experimental observational science. It is, it is a, a philosophical system, and so it is, I would call it a Spinozan word, a, a, a point of view on the word, and uh, you just so the same, uh, the same uh, 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 diagram in, uh, in Bernard's talk, there are two possible uh, attitudes. One is, on the left, it is Spinoza. There is only one possible word, because we can deduce everything from a fundamental theory. There is only one, as Spinoza would say, one substance. And then there is the, uh, the multiverse anthropic principle, a, a principle, uh, anthropic attitude that 
you have a fundamental theory that gives you or predicts multiverses, and then we cannot calculate from from uh, from fundamental theory what are, what the constant is, what the what the uh, uh, universe is. We just can use, and people are using some probability, uh, using some probability reasoning on multiverses, which is very controversial. And uh, Steven Weilberg deduce in a probabilistic way the value of the cosmological constant, but then has shown that by this method you cannot deduce other constants. And so all, all this is a bit fuzzy, and I will see, I, I will try to show you that uh, it might be a, simply a dead end. And also, I think that there's a very, I find a very strange attitude of modern, or most modern physicists is I have the impression that we have a final theory. It was not what Bernard said, because he was, a, 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 he was asking the question, do we have the theory? Is, 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 it, is it a theory of everything? But if you read most of what Stringer uh, writes or uh, other people uh, writing about fundamental physics, you have the impression that we know everything about the universe. And we can deduce the existence of this, the, the non-existence of that. And I would compare it with, uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, Lord Kelvin had this famous talk about, there was an attitude then in the physics, we know everything. We have, we have practically, we have Newtonian mechanics. On, the other, on one hand, on the other hand, we have Maxwell's electrodynamics. There are two small, Famous clouds. He writes uh, about about. He spoke. Doesn't work. Okay. The, he uh, he spoke spoke about the famous clouds, and the two clouds were the negative result of uh, Michelson Morley experiment, and the sort of catastrophe in ultraviolet. And as you know, one cloud gave rise to theory of relativity, and the other to quantum mechanics. So the clouds were very well chosen. Now. I would like to compare it with the progress in cosmology in, in, uh, in the second part of the 20th century. And I would say we knew much more. It was wrong, but we knew it much more in 1970 than we do now. Now, my colleague cosmologists are very proud. They claim, and they ask for money, claiming we know nothing about 95% of the universe. We made a lot of progress. We know almost nothing. But on the other hand, we know almost nothing, but then we can deduce the existence of universes of this and that. So this is something I find a bit, it's called hubris, I think in, in Greek. And I think I will show that it is based on a very shaky basis. So the common opinion is that I would, I summarize it. We cannot calculate the values of constants without atropic arguments because the super theory or the M theory predicts the existence of 10 to the 500 universes. So our work must be special since obviously there can be practically infinite number of combinations of constant values. And some people add that anyway, we know from inflation theory that the, an infinite number of universes exist. I will argue that this common opinion is simply unjustified. So let's start with the multiverses. This is come from a talk from Andre Linde. And so this is, I call it an I multiverses because it is a self reproducing inflationary universe. So they just grow universes. Uh, uh, it was shown also by, uh, by Bernard. And uh, so this is supposed to be given, obviously, by the inflation. Now, look, what is the status of inflation? You see that the... It's a bit weak. Can you see the light? Because I, I cannot see it. Okay, let's start. So you see the, the first stages 
of the expansion universe are based on microphysics and structure unknown. Inflation is speculated microphysics. Inflation is not a fundamental theory. It is an application of ideas for a completely different domain of physics to cosmology, to gravitational field, to expansion universe. And then the primordial universe reheating and biogenesis, the microphysics is not understood. So this fundam fun fundamental quote unquote theory is not even a theory. It is surprisingly good description of what happened in the universe, but it is based on concepts that are taken from, from different physics. And uh, there's, not a, there's not only one uh, inflationary physics there. This is from 2014 from the Encyclopedia Inflationaris, when there were 74 different uh, uh, inflationary theory. The problem is that to describe the inflationary universe, you need, you need a so-called uh, uh, potential. And this is the shape of this, of this potential. But to describe various things, you can, you, you can change your potential. So in the sense, it was a critic of the inflationary physics. It is not, it's not science because you have so many possibilities. You can, uh, if you have, now it's probably 100 uh, potentials, if you have 100 potentials, so you have a new uh, observation that contradicts the previous potential, you just change your potential. So it has no predictive power. And this was argued by a paper by, by uh, Elias uh, Steinhardt and, uh, and uh, Leb, which got a very funny reaction. Because you, if they were wrong, you would expect that somebody would point it at what is wrong. But not. We got a manifesto by 35 very distinguished physicists. Nobel Prize winners and uh, some very good colleagues who are mentioning that inflation cannot be wrong because there are so, so many publications, so many citations, so many people are uh, working on that. I don't think they mentioned the grants money they get. And it was 35 people and they, they probably forgot in a different context, of course, what Einstein said when he got a letter of 100 German physicist claiming that, uh, I don't remember, relativity is wrong. He said, why 100? One will be enough if I am really wrong. So this is an aspect I, I don't going to discuss, but there's some sociological aspect which I found a very, very worrying in modern physics that there's this fashion and then you have to, uh, you have to adapt to the fashion. If not, you will get, you will criticize not scientifically, but uh, you are trying to be, to be excluded. I, I, you know, there, there's a protest. How dare you tell you that I'm wrong? And I thought that until now, science was about this, telling you you are wrong. And then you say, no, I'm wrong because the experiments or, or, or the arguments show that I'm right. And not say, you know, we are more numerous than you. To that, I, I, I give the example of the uh, ether. Until 1905, 100% of physicists believe in ether. And then a junior clerk in a patent office just removed the ether with, with just one, one paper. He was not even a professor. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to complain anymore. What is also interesting, inflation does not follow from the superstring theory, the supposed theory of everything. I showed, the, I showed recently several papers trying to deduce or to, to obtain inflation from string theory. It doesn't work. Okay, so they tell you about the everything theory of everything. So let's go to the string theory. In string theory, what you observe nowadays, or a bit further in the, in the, in the, uh, in the past and in the distance, is the all low energy universe. And it is obtained by compactification. The original uh, string theory has 10, or maybe the M theory has 11 dimensions, but we need only four. Three special and one time 
But the compactification, there's no rule for compactification. We don't know how to comp compactify. And this is why there are 10 to the 500 different combinations. But doesn't mean, because it is used as an argument, that there are as many universes, 10 to the 500. So of course, if there are 10 to the 500 universes, then ours is very special. So let's look at how it works. So the string theory has 10 or 11 dimensions. We don't do the four, so they have to be quantified. There are enormous numbers of ways of compactification can happen. This is called the landscape. In this landscape, there is, there is a, a swamp land of unviable theories that are inconsistent, not even with observation, but with everything we know about physics. But there is something interesting in the string theory, as we know it now. You cannot vary the parameter in a continuous way because this would create fields and particles that are not observed. So it is discrete. So this gives you a, an idea that you could find, maybe from string theory, constants of physics. Because, of course, if it, could, if it was continuous, then it would be it will be a proof that you, you, can, you will never obtain the content of this, but they are discrete. But there is something that is not often mentioned about the string theory. It makes a prediction, because usually it says, oh, it doesn't make, it didn't make a prediction. It makes a prediction that in our world there exists supersymmetry. It's a very particular symmetry that, uh, okay, I, uh, it, for people who, because I don't know if everybody knows here who, what is supersymmetry, the, the particles in, in the universe we know are divided into fermions and bosons. And supersymmetry suppose that every fermion has a so-called superpartner bosonic and the bosonic partner has. And this was supposed to be tested by LHC, by the Large uh, Hadron Collider. You were told, of course, by the press release from the CERN that they are, they are looking for the Higgs, which is true, of course, and that they were supposed to reproduce the Big Bang, which, of course, it's, it was an exaggeration, but the real reason was to find supersymmetry. And they haven't found supersymmetry. So if supersymmetry is not found, it is the particular type of supersymmetry, then it it makes that a, a fundamental prediction of the string theory has not been confirmed. And it is absolutely necessary because uh, as, as Professor Heller has shown uh, how these things were, you, how you create gauge fields when you break symmetry. The problem with gravitation is that you break symmetry as, with the gauge field, then you get infinities that cannot be normalized, renormalized. It can be only realized if there is supersymmetry. So if there is no supersymmetry confirmed, there's something wrong with this thing theory. Okay. Now, what we know about compactification? Not much, but there is some interesting thing about compactification. When you compactify the additional uh, um, dimension, you get the vacuum which is not a, a vacuum infinity, but it is there the, the compactification creates walls around this, uh, uh, this vacuum, which creates the well-known experimentally confirmed Casimir effect that creates energy and, and the force by, uh, that has been confirmed by, by, by observations. And so you could speculate that the real universe will be the one with the, with the minimum uh, uh, Casimir energy, and there's a good chance there will be only one. And we'll have the constant of physics, hopefully our constant of physics. But we are not unable, we, we are not able, to, we are totally unable to, to make any calculation of, 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 of compactification. Just a, a a remark about compactification. You could use the fact that there's no reason, no reason ex explicit in the string theory to, to compactify six or seven to get four. The reason 
they, they are four that we live in a, in a four dimensional universe. And you need three special uh, dimensions to have in information network, et cetera, et cetera. But so there will be a hope in string theory, if it is the correct theory, of, of getting a, an argument about dimensions. But if you take the M theory with 11 uh, 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 dimensions, then it contains supergravity, and then with the supergravity, when you do some mathematical operation, you, gi you get four uh, favorite, favorized uh, dimensions. So it, even this uh, could disappear as an argument for, uh, uh, for as I read the, the, uh, the word, anthropics. So, I'm almost finished with the string theory, then I will, I will come to life. There's some facts that are not often found in the general literature, but I found in a private communication by Mark Perry and Najitkov is the, in string theory, the process of computation is not properly understood. So the basic problem is not understood. String theory is a coherent theory of perturbation gravitons, but this graviton live in a space time that is doesn't follow from the string theory. Because string theory is not the theory of, of, of space-time. We don't have a quantum theory of space-time. And since Freeman Dasson was already quoted, I quote another thing. Uh, uh, okay, it's on, on, the, on the next uh, uh, transparency, Freeman Dasson said we might have a, a, th a quantum theory of gravitation in 200 years. So I will finish this part with a question by Linde, Andre Linde, who asked in a talk, can we forget about multiverse and return back to the universe? I said, no, unless we can do all these things simultaneously, find an alternative to string theory, find an alternative to inflation, and find an alternative to the cosmological constant problem and of many other kinds of problem. And my answer to this is, to the first is, if, as likely string theory is not the theory of everything, finding an alternative is necessary. As already mentioned by Mernot, there are alternatives to inflation, and in a way, we still have to prove that it can be derived from fundamental theory, inflation. And finding one two, of course, will give you three. But it may be in 200 years, which of course is a problem for modern physics, because you cannot apply for a grant that will give results in 200 years. I mean, you can, but you will be rejected. Even, even I think by the, by the NCNC in Poland, I think it's because they, sometimes they do very strange things. But. Okay, and now the last comment about physics, less will be about biology, and it is, there is some fashion in physics. You see, there is a hypothesis called MOND, that, we, uh, that, we, that was proposed 40 years ago, which is not ignored by the, it's ignored by the most of the community, but not by all. And, and next month, there will be a conference celebrating in, uh, this in, uh, in St. Andrews with very distinguished speakers. And this is a theory that explains perfectly the structure of galaxies. On the, galaxy, on the galactic level, it is perfect. It is much better than uh, cold dark matter. And it explains, among other things, a relation between the final uh, velocity of in, in, uh, rotation velocity in the galaxy and the baryonic content matter of the, of the, the, of the, in, in the galaxies. It explains perfectly the uh, rotation curves which the Newtonian theory plus dark matter does not. And it is based on the existence of a acceleration, a critical acceleration, which plays the role of this, the speed of light uh, uh, plays, uh, uh, plays in, the, uh, in the theory of relativity. And there is an outstanding coincidence. This acceleration is connected describing local processes connected to the universe. It is connected to the Hubble constant. It is 
simply the Hubble constant uh, multiplied by the speed of light. So it is an amazing coincidence, but of course, it's, as I far know, it's totally, totally ignored by, by the anthropist. And because it's not fashionable, because pref people prefer, and I can understand that, work with dark matter of unknown origin, never confirmed, than to modify the law of physics. I mean, this is human. But there is this coincidence. Okay, so now I will, uh, the, the last part of my talk is about the origin of life. We don't know the origin of life. This is a book, this is the cover of a book that's been published two months ago. And it's, the title is very <laughs> telling, it says conflicting models of the origin of life. And you see there is, there are 25 models of who was first. Because we, as I will say in more detail, we don't know how life started. And uh, as you can see, there is, I mean, I, I didn't even know because, of course, I'm not, I'm not special. I knew about the RNA word. Uh, I knew about the RNA in paper word, but there, is, there are even words of minerals and sick words. We don't, we don't even know where it started. You have 14 hypotheses. So this is a warning when you're asking, is the universe fine-tuned to life? How can we answer such a question if we don't know how, what are the conditions for the, for, the, for the appearance of life? And what is life? Why is this a word? I, I, I <laughs> wanted to, to show you a, a beautiful quotation from a book uh, called Genome by uh, Matt Ridley. And he, he of course, imitate, I think it's in Poland, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't try to explain what is the, but there are some foreigners maybe who, who uh, are um, not familiar with, the, uh, with St. John's uh, Gospel. So in the beginning was the word. And the word proselytizes. Why is the word? Because this is the genetic code. This is the table of the genetic code. And the genetic code is written in codons, which are three letters word. And this, there are 20 possible amino acids, and the, the way of synthesizing them, of making them, is, is contained in this table. And this table is not, it, 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 it's organized in a way that it's a, it is a code. It is the code of life. It is universal. It's the same with small changes. It's the same describing the, the, the uh, bacteria and, and, and myself. And the bacteria can eat me and myself, we, uh, we are described by the, by the same code. All the life on Earth is, is uh, described by this code. What is amazing about this code, sorry, <laughs> I, I should know, maybe I should do this, then I can, uh, uh, make gesticulations. There are 10 to the 84 possible alternative code tables, but only one was chosen. So the, if you use probability in, in such a context, it makes, it makes no much sense. Uh, so I just, I'm not sure that everybody's aware how it works. So just an example to show you how amazing just the basic is that you have, you have of course, the double helix, in which you have the uh, uh, which code with, on which the code is written. So uh, then, the DNA replicate. So there is, and uh, I will tell you, I will show you in a moment the, the replication. Then there is the transcription, because what what creates really uh, what synthesizes the the uh, the proteins is the is the uh, uh, RNA the the messenger RNA that now after COVID everybody of course knows because of the of the uh, vaccines so there is a transcription and then there is what is called translation it is the this code written on the on the messenger RNA is uh, read 
by the transfer RNA in the ribosome that are uh, that are a machine creating uh, uh, in a way that I will show in this movie. Ah, sorry, I forgot it is PDF. There's a, there was a movie showing that it is a it is a machine that creates life in a, in an amazing way by reading the code. There is an an uh, anthropic aspect in that that the replication consists in separating the two the, uh, the in uh, unwin unwinding and separating the uh, the two stems of the of the of the dna and now by purpose they have weak they are joined by weak hydrogen uh, chemical uh, bond, bonds so they can be separated now as as uh, shown by Elise uh, Uzon recently in the book in fact you uh, about fine tuning if the uh, uh, supple structures constant were different it would be impossible it would be stronger the the, the, the bonds would be would, would be too strong to be separated so it is an interesting anthropic aspect. Of course, the, the, the astrophysical limits on, on alpha are, are, are tighter, which is also interesting. But this machine, this code, and this machine, where it comes from? If you compare it to, because it's like a machine tool. And in machine tools, there's so-called G-code written by, by humans, of course even if they are sometimes so clever that you wonder if they are really humans but but of course it is so primitive compared to the to the to the code of life that you ask yourself who wrote the code and i just put quotations from from this recent publications about the origin of the life that is uh, we are so far from understanding that you can take Hundred maybe of years. It's, uh, they say fifty years, but because the question is the real question is who wrote the code. But of course, it's not a scientific question. There are people who give this uh, this uh, this answer. There is the intelligent design, uh, which is in this context, of course, very very popular. But maybe it's true, but it's not scientific answer. It's so. Here comes the multiverses. This is Eugene Kunin, a, a geneticist from Washington, D.C., who proposed an element of multiverses in the origin of life. Because uh, he says the probability to get this code by evolution is practically impossible. The probability, he calculated the probability, is so low that it makes no sense. So the answer, according to Kunin, he's from Washington DC, so he knows William Keen, and that's why he has in eternal uh, inflation. He, he proposed this, this evolution of life that there is a chance anthropic selections at some stage. And then goes the, the, the Darwinian evolution in a way that uh, this is one, one of the possible uh, possible ways of, of, of getting uh, uh, life evolve from, not from nothing, but, but just from, from molecules. But he claims that you need uh, the chance anthropic selection that can be possible only if you have multiverses. Then you have an infinite number of universes and in, in, in the eternal uh, inflation, in infinite time, everything is infinite. The problem is there is no intern, eternal inflation. It's a misunderstanding. I've shown this is a very idealized model. And in fact, uh, as shown by Elisa Steger uh, and by Mercini, Houghton, and Perry, in, in practice, so to say, eternal inflation is impossible. So it's not an answer. Now, but even if the answer was multiverses, would it really be an answer? I, I, I was 
present when Kuhn in, uh, in Santa Barbara presented his talk, and I, my impression was that it is the same thing as proposing of God. So I told him that, you know, I know another hypothesis with much better literature and more ancient, and, and it's called God. And he said, yes, you're right, but you will have big difficulties defining God. And he was right too. So I propose to end my lecture a uncertainty principle. I put my name because not to be uh, uh, mistaken with, you know, uh, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Until we are certain what the universe is and what life is, we should refrain from asking whether the former is tuned, fine-tuned to the latter. Thank you very much. <laughs>